Um, so yes, thank you for the introduction. My name is, is Ruben and I would like to present you some uh, insights, I guess, into how we use the hyperfine interaction in nuclear structure research and specifically I will focus on one class of methods that fall under the umbrella of laser spectroscopy. So I work at the University of Ivascula, which is in Finland, and this is a picture I took uh, the day before I came here. Uh, it was about minus, well, it wasn't quite minus 30, it was minus 25, but I, I decided to round anyway to minus 30. And you might not be able to tell, but I'm standing in the middle of a lake because it's, uh, it's a few meters of ice by now. So the temperature change was quite, quite significant, but I, I'm enjoying it so far. go over here okay so the slides are changing on my laptop but not here which is not so great so while we, we sort that out maybe uh, a bit of an overview so um, I'm a nuclear I'm a nuclear physicist so not a solid-state physicist perhaps as as many of you are and that means so allow me to just briefly give you a few slides on, on a bit on radioactive ion beam facilities and a bit on laser spectroscopy as we apply it. Um, this slide is, is not really needed in this audience, I think, but I will show it anyway. For us, the hyperfine interactions, or for me at least, when you mention the name hyperfine interactions, I really see them as the key to probing the atomic nucleus. And specifically what we want to measure is the hyperfine structure of uh, a free atom or a free ion. And because of the coupling of the electron to the atomic nucleus, this hyperfine structure gives us a direct and model-independent way of, of measuring dipole moments, quadrupole moments, and uh, in, in a sense also the size of the atom, the charge radius of the, the nuclear, nuclear system. And the basic premise of all laser spectroscopy techniques in, in one form or another is to uh, scan a laser to excite the fine structure transition, but by doing it in high resolution, we get to actually resolve all of the detailed hyperfine structure splittings and thus extract all of the observables we are interested in. Um, we do this at radioactive ion beam facilities and um, as, as many of you probably also know there are many of these worldwide. Uh, this picture isn't technically showing you radioactive ion beam facilities but there's somehow a lot of overlap with it. So for instance where I work there's an accelerator laboratory in Finland but in Germany you will have GSI, you have in, in CERN, in um, Isolde in, in CERN, there's also Triumph, there's Riken, there's facilities all over the world. Um, and, and they somehow rely on different ways of producing radioactive nuclei. Um, and, and they all have their advantages and, and disadvantages. And specifically for laser spectroscopy, I think so far we've exploited two kinds of production facilities, if you will. That's the ISOL method and the EDSOL method. And I've had the, the luck and the opportunity to be able to work at both. Um, I won't go into too much detail while specifically we work mostly at those facilities, but one thing they have in common is that the interesting nuclei that we really want to study are produced at very low production rates. So basically all of the easy cases have more or less been done and now we're faced with the, the interesting challenge that the, the nuclei that we think will give us the most insight into the nuclear many-body problem, well those are really hard to make. Even if you manage to make them, usually you don't just get a, a monoisotopic beam. Usually you get a cocktail beam and also usually there is much more unwanted contamination in the beam than there is actual useful radioactive isotopes. And this can be, depending on the facility and the production method, this can be many orders of magnitude. We've run experiments where there has been, uh, I think, 10 billion times more of the unwanted stuff than of the actual isotopes of interest. And also, perhaps stating the obvious, but radioactive isotopes, well, they radioactively decay, so we can't just collect a sample and then quietly offline study it. It decays really rapidly. Right now, the state of the art can push us to, with laser spectroscopy, pushes us to studying millisecond half-life systems. So there's no time to dilly-dally, you need to, to move quite quickly. And this is an interesting, challenging aspect for experimental methods, and one that laser spectroscopy has been very successful in, in tackling. Um, it, I would say for the nuclear states with lifetimes down to a few milliseconds, I think it's become somewhat the method of choice. There are other methods, definitely, but it's one of the most prolific methods. That is, that's a fact. Um, here I show what we would call the nuclear charts. It's like the periodic table for nuclear structure physics. Um, so one, of, one a row here represents all the isotopes 
of, a, of an element, and then you have all the rows. So this is, starts at hydrogen and goes all the way past tin to the super heavy elements. The colored squares are things we have studied successfully with laser spectroscopy. And I think by now the picture is already outdated. The field is moving at an incredible, incredible speed. But I, I don't know if you can see it from the back. There's also some gaps in this chart. Uh, for instance, here, basically only stable isotopes have been studied. And this is related to two things, and I will come back to both. One is uh, production related. Some facilities simply cannot produce these elements. And this is because of, of chemistry reasons, uh, which is, again, a bit of an umbrella we physicists use to describe very complicated things. Um, and also, specifically for laser spectroscopy, is these elements also have a complex atomic structure. And that makes them difficult to actually do spectroscopy on. So even if a radioactive ion beam facility gives us these beams, they are still challenging. And I think that's where, where part of, of the future work will be. Another aspect where, as nuclear physicists, that we need to work on is pushing what I will call the sensitivity of the method, the efficiency, if you will. As I already said in the introduction, uh, we want to push out to really exotic nuclides, far, far from stability, because they give us, in a sense, they're the most extreme isotopes, and therefore they give us the more extreme uh, manifestations of certain properties of the nuclear, nuclear forces. Um, but these are, of course, difficult to produce, so we need efficient methods. And that's a large part of the development right now is, is in making this happen. And then the second thing is, well, what about uh, these unexploited beams? And then I think we need to be, as laser spectroscopists, need to be more creative in the facilities we use. So far, most of the work is done at Isolde, and is done at I and Ivascula, and, and Triumph, and facilities like this. But there's other facilities out there that so far have not been exploited as much as they perhaps should be. So let me now really focus in on the sensitivity aspect, and that will be what most of my talk is about. Um, I, I show here a, a bit of a, an overview of measurements in literature. On the x-axis, I show the line width of our measurements, the resolution, if you will, and the y-axis is the production yield of the isotopes. And you can immediately, I think, see, so the dots are our measurements. You can see there's two broad categories to identify. There's low resolution, but down to very low yields. And there's higher resolution, but not quite as low in terms of yields. And again, this chart is not complete, but it, it shows a bit of an overview. And really what we need now in nuclear structure research is we need to go here. We need to be both efficient and have the resolution to really be able to fully measure all of the subtle hyperfine structure splittings. So there's two ways of doing that. One is go from here, go down. And the other is go from here, go left. There's perhaps a third way, which is think of something revolutionary, and, and that just happens to land there. But so far, we've, we've not managed to do that. And I will specifically talk about the road down, um, even though you could easily fill another few hours of talks on the, the opposite direction as well. And in the past five to 10 years, I would say these are, this is, I just threw some words on the slides for the nuclear physicists, you, you might recognize them. It, it's not too important. These are paths that we're taking, so this, this this is what we would call in-source laser spectroscopy. This is, is a bit of an umbrella term here for higher resolution methods. I will just call them collinear methods, even though that's a simplification. So in the in-source community, there, there's, there's approaches that have been proven to be very successful and will likely play a very important role in the future. But for collinear laser spectroscopy, uh, I will focus on just, just this one. I should also mention there will be a talk later today um, on another project. Uh, as well. So what's the idea of collinear laser spectroscopy? Well, let's dive right into that and then I will also explain to you what, what CRIS is and how it is different from that. So the basic principle is, is quite simple in a sense. Uh, our radioactive ion beam produces us a beam. Uh, usually this, is, this will be a thermal beam, so a, a slow beam at the production point in the facilities we've looked at most. And the idea of collinear laser spectroscopy is to accelerate that beam to a few 10 kilovolts, so not a super high energy, definitely not, not an impossible task. Um, so to accelerate that beam, send it down, down a beam line basically, and overlap it with one laser. Now because of the acceleration that we have, we basically managed to uh, get rid of the, the biggest problem we have in laser spectroscopy, and that is thermal broadening. If you do laser spectroscopy on a sample at, at room temperature or produced in a hot ion source, you basically won't resolve much. You will get very broad lines. The reason is uh, 
thermal, a thermal ensemble, every atom has a slightly different velocity, there's a Doppler effect, they all observe a slightly different laser frequency, so you get smeared out optical resonances. By accelerating them, this velocity spread essentially gets compressed to points where it's irrelevant. It, it becomes really, really small. And then by overlapping a laser with this now very nice, clean, uh, mono-velocity uh, beam, you can do very, very narrow and high-resolution spectroscopy. And the conventional collinear laser spectroscopy tries to excite an atom, and then when the atom de-excites again, it emits a photon, and you try and detect that photon. And that's the basic premise of the methods, uh, simplifying quite a bit. And this method is probably responsible for most of the red squares you saw earlier in that nuclear chart. There are some limitations to this, though. Detecting photons uh, is not that easy. And, and the efficiency of the process is quite low. And as you know, there's photons everywhere around us. That it's very easy to get, get elevated background. And when you really start trying to measure signals for beams produced at only a few particles per second, every photon, every background photon hurts a lot. And so the method has mostly been limited by both efficiency and background considerations. Now, what's the modification? The modification is to not fire one laser, but is to complicate the problem further by sending many lasers. Instead of sending just one laser, you will send, uh, for example, another one or many others. And the idea is rather than waiting for the atom to de-excite and trying to detect a photon, we will laser ionize it and try to detect an ion. Now, the advantage of detecting ions is this can be done very efficiently. In our community, we've developed a whole host of methods of detecting radioactive decays, detecting charged particles themselves. It's not 100% efficient, but it's, it's getting there. And secondly, um, there are not so many sources of spurious background events. Yeah, you don't start just create an ion somewhere at random, which you would then detect. So in principle, the method has the potential of offering background-free, highly efficient spectroscopy. We're not quite background-free, but we're working, uh, working towards it. And that's what we would call collinear resonance ionization spectroscopy. Now, I should, of course, mention we didn't think of the idea of resonance ionization spectroscopy. This is a tool we use in our community already for a while. But putting these ideas together somehow required lots of technical developments, which have only really made the method feasible in the last five to 10 years. Uh, this, uh, and this is more of a, a fancy slide with some colorful pictures, this requires quite a big laser laboratory, I would say. Most of our time is spent in the laser laboratory trying to set up the lasers to prepare for these measurements. Um, that we, have, we say we currently have 20 laser systems in operation. That's a bit of an exaggeration. This includes the equivalent of laser pointers as well, so it's, it's not that bad. Um, but nevertheless, we have quite a big array of, of different complementary laser systems. And, and this absorbs quite a bit of time and also quite a bit of, quite a bit of money, of course. Now, I will give you three reasons to use the methods. I should also, of course, have a slide three reasons uh, not to use CRIS, uh, but I typically don't show that slide at conferences. So three reasons to use CRIS uh, despite the added complexity, because it is a, a complicated method. And the first one is in line with the introduction I've given so far. Um, it allows you to push towards these exciting uh, key physics goals. I will also say with, with some arguments that the selective reionization provides flexibility that so far I think we've underexploited, and I will try and explain what I mean by that. And also, and, and this I hope I spent a quite hope to spend quite a bit of time on, it allows you to study what I will call spectroscopically challenging systems, complex atoms and even complex radioactive molecules um, can be studied, I would say, more easily because of the advantages of the method. So push towards exciting physics goals. I've already sort of said why this is important. One example, uh, nucleus that we're really interested in is 78 nickel. Uh, this is the equivalent of, well, it has a closed shell for protons and it has a closed shell for neutrons, or at least that's what theories think. Uh, we have some reason to believe that might not be the case. So we need to investigate this. And one of the cleanest probes for the structure of the nickel isotopes are actually the copper isotopes. And measurements using the conventional methods, let's say of the that were developed before uh, allowed to push out to 75 copper. And I should stress here, this is already 10 isotopes away from stability. This is already a very challenging experiment, and these are already very exotic, short-lived isotopes. But we nevertheless had to, go, had to go a little further and get as close as we could. And this is where the CRISP method then comes in. So what I show here is a spectrum of the conventional collinear methods. And just for the people in the back, there's about 300 counts on the peak 
and about 250, 200 counts in the background, which is good. It's a, a nice signal to noise ratio and it's definitely sufficient for precise spectroscopy. But then we can of course compare it to the new methods. The first plot I show here is actually already 76 copper. So the yields are already down by a factor of five to 10. Um, the signal to background here is a thousand to one. So this is orders of magnitude improvement easily. Um, and 77 copper, quite easy, and 78. And that's where the background starts slowly creeping in. So if I can, if the nuclear structure physicist in the room will allow me to simplify, this is several orders of magnitude improvement compared to the state of the art before. I should also mention though, this is one of the spectroscopically easiest systems there is for more challenging systems. Uh, we can discuss the details. But in principle, the method gives you a, a significant boost in sensitivity, which is, which is what we need. You might also see 79. I, I don't show you a spectrum of 79 copper, and that was really the physics goal. Um, more work to be done. I hope next conference to be able to show that. I also believe selective reionization provides you with flexibility, because in, in detecting a photon, there's not much you can, you can do besides detecting the photon. Um, by creating an ion, there's many other options, especially in our, in our field, we have all these tools that can use these ions in creative ways. And the most obvious thing we could think of was to do a decay spectroscopy experiment with that, where we really try to study the radioactive decay of the thing we've just laser ionized. And I showed two examples, and they sort of serve opposite goals. One is, for instance, we can choose to only laser ionize the nuclear isomer or a nuclear ground state, because we also have isomers in nuclear, nuclear structure. And, and the reason you might want to do that is because their decay patterns largely overlap. So you see here, this is an alpha decay line. Uh, these in principle overlap. So if you produce a, a beam with both ground state and isomer, you can't really determine the alpha energies because they exactly overlap. If you can produce a 100% pure beam of one, everything becomes much, much easier. So that, that I think is an advantage that can be used in the future. You can turn the problem on its head. You can use the uh, selectivity of the decay process to clean your experimental spectra by only plotting here events that are, you know, that emit, in this case, a beta particle of the right energy. By only selecting those, we could reduce the background of these measurements by a lot. And this is 52 potassium that we could, in this way, pull out of the, the huge cocktail beam that was anyhow present. And the spectrum here for the other nuclear physicists in the room, this was taken in 20 hours. Um, which I think is also quite an impressive amount given the, the low abundance of this isotope. We, we hope to do 53 potassium in the coming years as well. And then uh, maybe the meat and potatoes of the talk in some sense, these spectroscopically challenging systems. And I, and I could have shown you a complicated atom, but that would have been more of the same. So instead I decided, let's not, why not show you a very complex molecule? And this is the first time that a radioactive molecule has been studied by, well, maybe not anyone, but certainly by us. Um, and there was a good reason to do so. In particular, we studied uh, radium fluoride molecules. So the radium does not have stable isotopes. Uh, so they're, this is a decaying molecule, which makes it interesting. There's a good reason to study fluoride molecules. Um, and and I'm, I'm taking the, the physicist shortcut here. I'm just showing you a whole bunch of nature papers on fluoride molecules. And you'll have to believe me, they are very, very interesting. Um, one reason is because they, they should be sensitive to parity and parity time violation effects and a whole host of other beyond standard model physics. Now, our measurements won't produce any beyond standard model constraints, but they will help these kinds of experiments push forwards. And the reason why radium fluoride is so sensitive is because basically radium is heavy. Um, so there's a large Z playing a role there, and that makes, uh, makes it better. Now, before we did our measurements, since it's radioactive, there was literally zero spectroscopic information. We know radium fluoride exists, and that was all we knew about it. And so we intended, we, we wanted to change that. Now, this is complicated, though, because molecular structure is sort of, the complexity of the system starts increasing and increasing. It's, it's unbelievably complicated for us poor atomic spectroscopists. There's more than a thousand states which, which get populated. There's uh, thousands, thousands of lines, and there's because nothing was known, we also knew we had a huge frequency range to scan. Uh, there's a number here, a thousand inverse centimeters. This is basically a thousand times larger than anything we'd ever scanned before. So it's it's very, very challenging, and this is all of that with yields of only a million per second. Now a million is a big number, but compared to a macroscopic sample, a million is is nothing. Right? So it's it's very challenging. 
Um, but we nevertheless figured that collinear resonance ionization spectroscopy is the ideal tool um, because we can easily switch to very broadband laser systems, quickly identify resonances, and then zoom in to the full resolution um, that we can offer. Plus, also from our measurements, we can not only determine uh, these, these energy levels here, uh, we can also identify higher lying energy levels, we can determine the ionization potential, and we can rapidly switch from one measurement mode to another. And for all of these reasons, we, we, we thought we had a shot at really providing useful information. And, and so magically we did. So this is this whole giant range I was, I was mentioning. Um, I, I think I have somewhere here on the slides. Uh, if you were to do this using a conventional method, it would take you something like 2,000 days. There's not a single radioactive ion beam facility in the world that will give you 2,000 days of access to the machine because it's incredibly expensive. Uh, this we managed to do in, in four hours, which is a crazy uh, achievement. Honestly, we were hoping to see a peak after eight days. And then we, we saw a lot more, as I will show you. So in the middle here is, a, is a, some structure. I, I show you zoom in here. So what you see here is vibrational states and then rotational bands built on top of that and then row vibrational states. I don't really understand molecules. It's complicated. Um, so we did this for uh, 226 radium with fluorine 19. So 226 radium fluorite is what I call it, even though that's not the right name. Uh, once we had done that, we figured, well, why stop there? We did 225, 224, 223, and 228. And the shortest lived here was, was three days, uh, lifetime for the radium, which I think in any other lab would be very difficult to do. Um, but in principle, we could have gone even, even further. Now, once we have this structure, we can zoom in even more. So if we then switch to a narrow band uh, scanning mode, so we really zoom into just this area, and again, you have a whole forest of peaks that suddenly appears. So this unresolved, asymmetric thing is many, 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 many peaks. And you can already see this has 1,400 counts, this has only 20 counts. So there's lots of them, and it really makes the measurement very difficult. So this gives you, this will give the people who will analyze this access to rotational constants, vibrational constants, or row vibrational constants, and a whole host of other fit parameters, uh, which are, are deemed useful. And what is perhaps interesting, since I'm at the Hyperfine Structure Conference, if you again zoom in into just one of these peaks, it turns out it's not just one peak, there's hyperfine structure in the molecule. So at this point, uh, our usual analysis approaches break down and we just scanned and hoped we had everything that was interesting to measure. Um, so yeah, we have hyperfine structure in this peak and we, we, we observed it in many other peaks. It was much larger than our molecular theorists thought it would be. So apparently radium fluoride has a very good sensitivity to the structure of the radium itself, which who knows, maybe the nuclear structure uh, physicists will exploit one day. I don't know. Um, now, what, what did we get from these measurements? And there's a lot. So we, we identified transitions between many rotational, vibrational, and row vibrational states. We identified higher lying excited states. We also did multi-step laser ionization schemes. So we've developed a whole, whole lot. Crucially, it seems from this structure that there is the possibility of laser cooling this molecule, which is uh, not so important for us maybe, but for this community that wants to do beyond the standard model physics, this is vital. If, it, if we had shown you cannot laser cool radium fluorides, I think the community would have lost interest immediately. So this was really a crucial observation. Um, and we also could measure the hyperfine structure of this, of this molecule, which apparently is really needed to benchmark molecular structure calculations as well. So huge output. Um, and I should stress, none of this we really expected. Again, we were hoping to maybe see one resonance, and then we saw thousands. So that was an interesting uh, change. And I think it should also be remembered forever as the biggest risk we ever took at Chris, but perhaps also the biggest payoff we've ever had as well. So with that, um, let me wrap things up again. So what does the future now hold for laser spectroscopy in our community? Um, I've mentioned the sensitivity frontier. We need to push further from stability, and we need to um, devise ways of doing it, not only in our comfort zone of our usual laboratories, but also at these other laboratories, other production facilities that so far have been unexplored. And we need to fill these gaps. I think there's many questions, open questions, that currently cannot be answered because we simply do not have the tools to study these, uh, these gaps in the landscape. Uh, progress here will be significantly slower, but that shouldn't prevent us from, from doing so. Now, not mentioned so far is the precision frontier, if you will, and that's where we start really doing measurements of, and there's many terms here, hyperfine anomalies, uh, higher order moments, 
and then this beyond standard model effect. And I, I believe Wilfried will give a talk somehow related to hyperfine, hyperfine anomalies and, and these things. So that's another aspect that should definitely not be forgotten. We have a well-defined program, a very ambitious program ahead of us, and there's continuous uh, developments going, going towards that. And I, I hope I, could, I gave you a glimpse on a sliver of all the work that our field has been doing, because there's really a lot of it. And I think throughout the day, you will see other examples. So with that, thanks to my colleagues, obviously, and also to all of you for your kind attention. <laughs>